I stood tiptoe upon a little hill. The air was cooling and so very still that the sweet buds, which with the modest pride pulled droopingly in slanting curve aside, there scantily leaved and finely tapering stems, had not yet lost those studied diadems caught from the early sobbing of the morn. The clouds were pure and white as the flocks new shorn, and fresh from the clear brook. Sweetly they slept on the blue fields of heaven, and then there crept a little noiseless noise among the leaves, born of the very sigh that silence heaves. For not the faintest motion could be seen of all the shades that slanted o'er the green. There was wider wandering for the greed star, to peer about upon variety, far round, the horizon's crystal air to skim, and to trace the dwindled edgings of its brim. To picture out the quaint and a curious bending of a fresh woodland alley never ending, or by the bowery clefts and leafy shelves, guess where the jaunty streams refresh themselves. I gazed a while and felt as light and free as though the fanning wings of a mercury had played upon my heels. I was lighter hearted and many pleasures to my vision started. So I straightway began to pluck a posy of luxuries bright, milky, soft and rosy, a bush of May flowers with the bees about them. Ah, sure, no tasteful nook would be without them, and let a lush laburnum oversweep them and let a long grass grow round the roots to keep them moist, cool and green, and shade the violets, that they may bind the moss in leafy nets. A filbert hedge with the wide briar overtwined, and clumps of woodbine taking the soft wind Upon their summer thrones, there too should be the frequent checker of a youngling tree that with a score of light green brethren shoots from the quaint mossiness of aged roots, around which is heard a spring ahead of a clear waters babbling so wildly of its lovely daughters, the spreading bluebells. It may haply mourn that such fair clusters should be rudely torn from their fresh beds and scattered thoughtlessly by infant hands left on the path to die. Open afresh your round of starry folds, ye ardent marigolds. Dry up the moisture from your golden lids, for great Apollo bids that in these days your praises should be sung on many harps which he has lately strung. And when again your Junis he kisses, tell him I have you in my world of blisses. So haply, when I rove in some far vale, his mighty voice may come upon the gale. Here are sweet peas, on tiptoe for the flight, with the wings of a gentle flush over delicate white, and the taper fingers catching at all things, to bind them all about with the tiny rings. Linger a while upon some bending planks, that lean against the streamlet's rushy banks, and watch intently nature's gentle doings. They will be found softer than ring doves cooings. How silent comes the water round that bend. Not the minutest whisper does it send to the overhanging sallows. Blades of grass slowly cross the checkered shadows pass. Why, 
you might read two sonnets ere they reach to where the hurrying freshness is a peach and nature of sermon o'er their pebbly beds. Where swarms of minnows show their little heads, staying their wavy bodies against the streams, to taste the luxury of sunny beans, tempered with the coolness, how they ever wrestle with their own sweet delight, and ever nestle their silver bellies on the pebbly sand. If you but scantily hold out the hand, that very instant not one will remain, but turn your eye and they are there again. The ripples seem right glad to reach those cresses, and cool themselves among the emerald tresses. The while they cool themselves, they freshness give, and moisture, that the bowery green may live, so keeping up an interchange of favours like good men in the truth of their behaviours. Sometimes cold finches one by one will drop from low hung branches, little space they stop, but sip and twitter and their feathers sleek. Then off at once, as in a wanton freak, or perhaps to show their black and golden wings, pausing upon their yellow flutterings. Were I in such a place, I sure should pray that naught less sweet might call my thoughts away than the softer rustle of a maiden's gown fanning away the dandelion's down, than the light music of her nimble toes patting against the sorrel as she goes. How she would start and blush, thus to be caught playing in all her innocence of thought. Oh, let me lead her gently o'er the brook, wash her half-smiling lips, and a downward look. Oh, let me for one moment touch her wrist, let me one moment to her breathing list. And as she leaves me, may she often turn her fair eyes, looking through her locks a burn. What next? A tuft of evening primroses, o'er which the mind may hover till it dozes, o'er which it well might take a pleasant sleep, but that tis ever started by the leap of the buds into ripe flowers, or by the flitting of the divers moths that hay their rest acquitting, or by the moon lifting her silver rim above a cloud and with a gradual swim, coming into the blue with all her light. O oh, maker of sweet poets, dear delight of this fair world, and all its gentle livers, spangler of the clouds, hail of the crystal rivers, mingler with the leaves, and the dew and the tumbling streams, closer of lovely eyes to lovely dreams, lover of loneliness and the wandering, of upcast eye and the tender pondering. Thee must I praise above all other glories that smile us on to tell delightful stories. For what has made the sage or poet's right but the fair paradise of a nature's light, in the calm grandeur of a sober line, we see the waving of the mountain pine, and when a tale is a beautiful estate, we feel the safety of a hawthorn glade. When it is moving on luxurious wings, the soul is lost in pleasant smotherings. Fair dewy roses brush against our faces, and the flowering laurels spring from diamond vases. Overhead we see the jasmine and the sweet briar, and the bloomy grapes laughing from green attire, while at our feet the voice of a crystal bubbles charms us at once away from all our troubles, so that we feel uplifted from the world.
walking upon the white clouds, wreathed and curled. So felt he, who first told how Psyche went on the smooth wind to realms of a wonderment. What Psyche felt and love when their full lips first touched, what amorous and fondling nips they gave each other's cheeks with all their sighs, and how they kissed each other's tremulous eyes. The silver lamp, the ravishment, the wonder, the darkness, loneliness, the fearful thunder. Their woes gone by, and both to heaven upflown, to bow far gratitude before Jove's throne. So did he feel, who pulled the boughs aside, that we might look into a forest wide, to catch a glimpse of a fawns and a dryadis coming with the softest rustle through the trees. And the garlands woven of the flowers wild and sweet, upheld on ivory wrists or sporting feet, telling us how fair trembling syrinx fled Arcadian Pan with such a fearful dread. Poor nymph, poor Pan, how did he weep to find naught but a lovely sighing over the wind along the reedy stream, a half heard strain full of sweet desolation, balmy pain. What first inspired a bard of old to sing Narcissus pining over the untainted spring? In some delicious ramble he had found a little space with the boughs all woven round, and in the midst of all a clearer pool than air reflected in its pleasant cool the blue sky here and there serenely peeping through tenderly wreaths fantastically creeping and on the bank a lonely flower he spied a meek and forlorn flower with a note of pride drooping its beauty over the watery clearness to woo its own sad image into nearness Deaf to light as Zephyrus, it would not move, but still would seem to droop, to pine, to love. So while the poet stood in this sweet spot, some fainter gleamings over his fancy shot. Nor was it long ere he had told the tale of a young Narcissus and sad Echo's pale. Where had he been? From whose warm head out flew that sweetest of all songs, that ever knew, that hay refreshing, pure deliciousness, coming ever to bless the wanderer by moonlight, to him bringing shapes from the invisible world, unearthly singing from out the middle air, from flowery nests, and from the pillowy silkness that rests full in the speculation of the stars. Ah, surely he had burst our mortal bars, into some wondrous region he had gone to search for thee, divine Endymion. He was a poet, sure a lover too, who stood on Latimer's top, what a time there blew soft breezes from the myrtle vale below, and brought in faintness a solemn, sweet, and slow a hymn from Dion's temple, while upswelling the incense went to her own starry dwelling. But though her face was clear as infant's eyes, though she stood smiling o'er the sacrifice, the poet wept, at her so piteous fate, wept that such beauty should be desolate. So in finer wrath some golden sounds he won, and gave meek Cynthia her endymion. Queen of the wide air, thou most lovely queen of all the brightness that mine eyes have seen. As thou exceedest all things in thy shine, so every tale does this sweet tale of thine. Oh, for three words of honey, that I might tell but one wonder of thy bridal night.
where distant ships do seem to show their keels, Phoebus the while delayed his mighty wheels, and turned to smile upon thy bashful eyes, ere he his unseen pomp would solemnize. The evening weather was so bright and clear that men of health were of unusual cheer, stepping like Homer at the trumpet's call, or young Apollo on the pedestal, and lovely women were as fair and warm as Venus looking sideways in alarm. The breezes were ethereal and pure, and crept through half-closed lattices to cure the languid sick. It cooled their fevered sleep, and soothed them into slumbers full and deep. Soon they awoke clear-eyed, nor burnt with the thirsting, nor with the hot fingers, nor with the temples bursting, and springing up, they met the wondering sight of their dear friends, nigh foolish with delight, who feel their arms and breasts and kiss and stare, and on their placid foreheads parted the hair. Young men and maidens at each other gazed, with the hands held back, and motionless, amazed to see the brightness in each other's eyes. And so they stood, filled with the sweet surprise, until their tongues were loosed in poesy. Therefore no love did of anguish die, but the soft numbers in that moment spoken made silken ties that never may be broken. Cynthia, I cannot tell the greater blisses that follow divine, and thy dear shepherd's kisses. Was there a poet born? But now no more. My wandering spirit must no further soar.